In this segment, we'll discuss the postulates of special relativity, the concept of the interval, and its immediate implications. The basic postulate is that uh, laws of nature are identical in all inertial reference frames. So that means that um, the outcomes of any experiments, any measurements that you can make, will come out exactly the same uh, whether you're doing it in um, a lab reference frame on Earth or in a spaceship that's moving with respect to the Earth, as long as the reference frame is inertial, meaning moving at a constant velocity. Um, so this is quite familiar from classical mechanics, so it may seem like there's really nothing new here, but um, new things arise when we apply uh, this postulate to the um, uh, to the world in which interactions between particles are not instantaneous. Experimental observations tell us that um, no signals can propagate faster than the speed of light. That includes um, all the fundamental interactions. So if you have uh, two charges at a distance and you wiggle one of them, then the other will not know about it until a certain time it depends on the distance, and um, um, there's a fundamental constant, the speed of light, that determines how long it will take for the uh, um, detector to know about the um, emission of the signal uh, at, at some distance. So, um, if we apply the basic postulate that all laws of nature are identical in all inertial reference frames, that means that this speed of light c should be the same in all inertial reference frames. Now, um, this fully agrees with experiment, but um, it uh, contradicts the classical notion of absolute time. Absolute time means that um, clocks operate the same way in all inertial reference frames. There is a um, unique time that can be assigned uh, to any event, well, subject to the uh, global uh, shift of time. And then, um, um, because this time is absolute, that means if two events are simultaneous in one reference frame, they will be simultaneous in any other reference frame. If something, something happens in the future with respect to uh, something else, then this relation is the same in all reference frames, same thing with the past. So time is really um, um, uh, independent of, uh, of the choice of the reference frame and, and um, serves as some uh, global variable that doesn't care about the motion of uh, reference frames with respect to each other. Now, this notion of absolute time um, contradicts um, the, uh, um, the fact that the speed of light is the same in all reference frame, as it should be, uh, based on the uh, relativity postulate. So let's consider the following scenario. So consider the following situation. Here we have two reference frames. There is a reference frame K and the reference frame k prime, the x-axis for the two coincide, but the reference frame k prime is moving with respect to k with the velocity v in the direction of the x-axis. So the two axes, x and x prime, are always uh, the same, but they move with respect to each other. So let's now consider the following experiment. So at some point on the x-axis, some event occurs at a certain time. So let's call it event F, which could be, for example, turning on of a, of a flashlight. Let's now consider two points at the same distance from f to the left and right on the x prime axis, call them a and b. So these two points, along with the point f, 
are all at rest in reference frame k prime. So if we are an observer in, in k prime, one at a and one at b, so nothing is moving anywhere, we're at the same distance at f, so obviously we'll observe turning off on of a flashlight at the same time, right? It will take the same time for the signal from point f to reach points a and b. Now, how does this experiment look from the point of view of observers in reference frame k? Now, um, points a and b are both moving in the x direction with some velocity. Right? So point A is actually approaching the point where the light was emitted, and po point B is moving away from it. So clearly, um, the observer A will see the arrival of the signal from point F earlier than observer B. Um, so far, we cannot calculate uh, how much earlier, because we don't know the relativistic uh, velocity addition law. But we know these two events, the arrival of light to point A and point B, are not simultaneous from the point of view of the observers um, in point K. They will arrive at A and B at different times. So. Um, this is a contradiction with the classical notion of absolute time. Events that are simultaneous in K prime are not simultaneous in K. Note that uh, when we're talking about events, uh, we mean something that happens uh, at a particular point in a particular time. So in this case, uh, we could talk about two observers uh, placed at points A and B, and at a particular time they see the light and they make a record of it. So the conclusion of this exercise is that um, simultaneity of two events is frame dependent. And uh, we need to figure out how to fix the um, classical uh, geometry of uh, space and time uh, for this to appear explicitly, right? We need to work out how to transform the coordinates and time between the different uh, reference frames. So this will be our next task. Um, so in order to discuss this, we'll introduce a concept of an interval. So um, consider some reference frame. And um, consider two events. So events one and two, whatever they are. And um, event one has coordinates um, r1 and time t1. And event two occurs at point r2 at time t2. So we will introduce an interval as the following expression. We'll introduce the interval between the events 1 and 2 as c squared t2 minus t1 squared minus r2 minus r1 squared. Okay. So why is this a useful thing? We will see that, in fact, um, this quantity is an invariant. So if we measure the coordinates and time of the same event 1 and event 2 in a different reference frame, so they would have some other coordinates, we call them primed coordinates and times. So those are measured in a different reference frame. Right? So this would be a reference frame k prime, and this would be a reference frame k. So the interval, as we will see, um, 
is the same whether we express it through primed coordinates or unprimed coordinates. So generally speaking, you could expect that this S12 prime squared defined in this way would be different from S12 squared. If you just took some random expressions, they would certainly be different. But it turns out that uh, the interval is invariant. So how do we see that? Well, first, um, let's consider two events that represent the um, um, emission and um, observation of a ray of light. Okay, so uh, event one and uh, is the uh, emission of light. So, for instance, we take a flashlight and we blink it. And event two is the arrival of the signal at some other point. Okay, so uh, what can we uh, deduce from this? Well, um, both reference frames here are assumed to be inertial. Okay, so um, the distance um, between um, points R1 and R2 is uh, R2 minus R1. Well, if you square that, that's the square of the distance. Now, it should be equal to c squared, t2 minus t1 squared. Okay? So, all it says is that um, there's a distance squared equals c squared delta t squared, or in other words, simply c equals c delta t. That's the definition of the speed of light. Okay. Um, now, same thing is valid um, in the reference frame um, k prime, obviously. It's also uh, the emission of arrival of light. So R2 prime minus R1 prime squared equals C squared T2 prime minus T1 prime squared. Same C, right? It's the same speed of light in all reference frames. Okay? Now, the uh, S12 squared if we use the definition and we substitute this equality, we'll find that S12 is 0. And, of course, S12 prime squared is also 0. Okay? So the, uh, the conclusion that we can make here is that if S12 squared is 0, in some reference frame, then S12 prime squared is zero in any other reference frame. Okay, why is that? Well, because if it's the uh, um, emission and the arrival um, of a uh, light signal, then um, the velocity for the, for, the, for the propagation of that signal is the same in any reference frame. So interval uh, being zero is invariant. Now, this doesn't yet tell us that the interval itself is uh, invariant for any two events, but it's easy uh, to see that this must be the case. So in order to do this, consider two infinitesimally close events. Okay, so we have two events that are separated by um, infinitesimal distance and infinitesimal time. Okay, so uh, that's the uh, event one and event two 
um, close in both space and time. So then the differential ts squared can be written as c squared dt squared minus dr squared and ds prime squared is equal to c squared dt prime squared minus dr prime squared. Okay, So this is just by definition we apply it to, to two events that are very close to each other. Now, if it's not entirely clear what it means, let's write it in full glory. It's dt squared, and then here's dx squared minus dy squared minus dz squared. That's the meaning of dr squared. Now, ds squared and ds prime squared are both differentials of second order. So they must be proportional to each other. So let's call this proportionality lambda. Now lambda should reflect the transformation of coordinates um, and time between reference frame k and k prime where they measured. So what can lambda depend on? Now, um, so we have some reference frame k, some reference frame k prime, and uh, one is moving with respect to each other with some velocity. Now, because space is isotropic, uh, which means there is no uh, preferred direction, um, or the, the, the properties uh, don't depend on the orientation of, 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 um, of the experimental apparatus in absolute space. So that means that uh, nothing can depend on the direction of v. It can depend only on its magnitude. Right? Now, apart from the velocity v, there's nothing else that connects k and k prime. So this means that um, lambda has to be some function of v. Just its ma uh, absolute value and not orientation. It cannot depend on anything else. So let's now con uh, consider a triad of um, three reference frames. Let's call them k, k1, and k2. I don't want to use primes here. So k1 is uh, moving with respect to k with some velocity. Um, sorry, it's not k prime. It's k1 with velocity v1, and k2 moves with respect to k with some other velocity v2. Now, uh, we don't know the velocity addition law yet, so we can't tell the velocity of k2 with respect to k1, but uh, we know that there is some velocity. We'll learn later what it is, but if we consider k1 and k2 moving with respect to each other, there will be some other velocity, and let's call it v12. Right? So if we apply this expression to this triad, so between reference frame k and k1, we'll have this expression, ds squared equals lambda of v1, ds1 squared. Now, between k and k2, there's v2, ds2 squared, but also ds1 squared equals lambda of v12, ds2 squared, okay? Now, if we combine these two, we can write um, ds1 squared over ds2 squared in two ways. So from the first, um, from the first two expressions, um, this will be um, lambda of v2 divided by lambda of v1. 
but from the last expression, this will also be equal to lambda of v12. Okay? Now, um, what does it tell us? Well, v12, we don't know what it is, but v12 obviously depends on the angle between v1 and v2. So what does this mean? Well, if we change the angle um, between v1 and v2, um, so this expression stays constant while v12 changes. So the argument of lambda changes, but the function should stay constant, right? So this tells us that lambda of v must be a constant. But if it's a constant, here's the same expression. So that means lambda of v is actually simply 1. So we proved that ds squared is equal to ds prime squared in any other inertial reference frame. Now, this implies uh, ds is equal to ds prime. Now, for any two events, 1 and 2, we can connect them with a straight line in the four-dimensional space-time and integrate ds. So s12 will be equal to integral ds. And because ds is equal to ds prime, then s12 and s12 prime will be the same. So the full interval between two events, the finite interval between uh, two events, is also um, an invariant. It doesn't depend on the choice of the uh, reference frame. Okay? So this is a very important result. Um, now, you may notice some similarity between the definition of the interval and the de definition of a distance in Euclidean geometry. So in Euclidean geometry, the distance is defined as um, x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared plus z2 minus z1 squared. Now the interval, to remind, is defined as some coefficient t2 minus t1 squared minus um, r2 minus r1 squared. So that's simply the distance squared. So there's a minus sign here, where here we have pluses. So this is a pseudo-Euclidean distance. There are also squares, but there's a minus sign. And uh, this difference is very important. So in particular, this means that S12 squared can be positive or negative, or 0. Um, contrary to the distance, that's always positive. So the interval, the square of the interval, is not positive definite, which means the interval itself, the S12, can be both real and imaginary. Okay? Now, um, let's discuss the properties of an interval um, to get some basic understanding of it. Um, so first, let's... Um, let there be two events. So um, such that in system K, we have the events R1, T1, and R2, T2. And let's ask a question. Is there a reference frame k prime where r1 prime is equal to 
R2 prime. Or in other words, where the two events take place at the same place in the reference frame K prime. Okay? Now, we can use the invariance of the interval um, to write that um, S12 squared, which is C squared T12 squared minus L12 squared. So I use L12 squared to define R1 minus R2 squared. Okay. Now this must be equal to S12 prime squared. Now in the reference frame K prime, we're supposed to have T12 prime squared minus L12 prime squared, which is zero, because we want R1 prime and R2 prime to be the same. Now this is positive definite, so this must be equal to zero. So this gives us a condition that such a K prime where R1 is equal to R2 prime can exist only if S12 squared is positive. So the interval between two events such that S squared is positive is called a uh, time-like interval. And in reference frame K prime, we have the time between the two events is equal to S12 prime over C from this expression here. Okay? So this is one conclusion. Here's another question. Same, um, same question. We have two different events. Um, is there a K prime where the two events are simultaneous, meaning T2 prime is equal T1 prime? Now, notice that in classical mechanics, this would be a meaningless question. But um, now, because simultaneously, it, simultaneity is not absolute, then this is a very reasonable question to ask. So, um, well, uh, similarly, we can write S12 squared as C squared T2 prime minus T1 prime squared minus L12 prime squared, but this is zero by assumption. So this is simply minus L12 prime squared. So this whole thing is negative. So if S12 squared is negative, then, then there exists um, a k prime where uh, the two events are simultaneous. So this kind of an interval is called space-like interval. Now the reason for these names is quite straightforward. So um, a time-like interval is such that in some reference frame um, the difference between the two events is only in their time. They occur at the same point. Same, like, uh, same thing here. Uh, a space-like interval such that in some reference frame they occur at the same uh, time, which means the only thing that separates them is uh, that they're at different points. Notice that if the two events happen to the same body that is moving somewhere, so it's uh, event one and two. It's an actual object that's moving, and uh, this is his uh, position in time um, initially, and this is at the end. Then, well, because the body cannot move faster than the speed of light, then in this case, S12 squared 
c squared um, delta t squared minus delta r squared, it must be positive, right? Because delta r has to be less than um, c delta t. So this interval is time-like. Consider now a clock that is attached to this moving body. So this could be an actual clock that is moving along with this body, or it can be any physical process, like maybe um, a living organism that is ages uh, with time. And we're interested um, um, in figuring out uh, how much time will elapse on this clock during this uh, motion that results in this trajectory. So this uh, time that is shown by a clock in the reference frame in which it is at rest, it it's, is called proper time. So how do we figure it out? Well, um, the clock is at rest in reference frame k prime. So when we say k prime, we mean a reference frame which is inertial and moving at a certain velocity. So let's consider a point here along this um, path in uh, space-time. And um, the body has a certain velocity. So if, if this is a trajectory here, so there is a certain velocity at the given point. So let's consider the so-called co-moving reference frame. Um, which is instantaneously moving with the same velocity as the body itself. So, um, in this reference frame, which is co-moving with the body at the given uh, instant, so because the velocity of k prime is the same as the velocity of the body, then the body is instantaneously at rest in this reference frame. So all the differentials of the coordinates are zero. Okay, so um, if we write the interval, the differential interval squared for this little piece of the trajectory, um, if we write it in terms of reference frame k, that is uh, inertial at all times, uh, we'll have c squared dt squared minus dl squared, where dt and dl are measured in that one single reference frame k at all times. On the other hand, because the um, interval is invariant, this is also equal to c squared dt prime squared, because dl prime is zero, according to this. Okay? Now, from here, we can find dt prime. So dt prime from this is equal to dt we take it outside of this, and um, what remains is a square root, 1 minus dl squared over c squared dt squared. Right? Now, dl by dt is just v, the velocity of the moving body at the given time. So this is equal to dt square root 1 minus v squared over c squared. So this is a differential uh, proper time, which we can uh, integrate and find that the uh, finite uh, interval of time shown by the clock is equal to the integral square root 1 minus v squared over c squared d t from t1 to t2. So this is the proper time uh, shown by the moving clock expressed in terms of the um, um, velocity uh, measured um, in one single uh, inertial reference frame. Okay. Now clearly the square root here, 1 minus v squared over c squared, is um, less or equal to uh, less or equal to 1 if velocity is 0 
uh, then it's 1. If it's uh, anything other than 0, the square root is less than 1. So we have um, dt prime is always less than or equal to dt, which in turn implies that delta t prime is less or equal to delta t. So how do we interpret this result? Well, here we had events 1 and 2. So let's say that event 1 occurs at time uh, t1 at point A, and event 2 occurs at time t2 at point B. So event 1 is the departure of the body at time t1 from point A, and 2 is its arrival to point B at point t2. So initially, um, there's point A, point B, and there's a, our body that is at point A. And all of this is at time t1. Okay, So the body carries a clock with it. So there's a clock that's going to be moving. And there's also a clock that remains at rest at point A in the reference frame K. And we can also place a synchronized clock at point B, and it shows the same time as uh, the clock at point A. Now, at time t2, the body has moved from point A to point B. So we still have points A and B in reference from K, and now the body has reached point B, and it shows some time that elapsed um, according to its own clock. Now, the point of the statement that delta t prime is less than delta t is that if we now compare what the moving clock shows compared to the clock that remains at B, it's this same clock we'll find that the clock at point B shows a larger time period elapsing in reference frame K compared to the moving body. Okay, so this is delta T prime, what the clock shows, and delta T is the time it took in the uh, stationary reference frame, which is just T2 minus T1. So this is called time dilation. Uh, if your a clock is moving and you compare it with stationary clocks, that the time elapsed, uh, elapsed according to the moving clock is uh, shorter than the time um, elapsed according to the stationary clocks. Now, incidentally, we can also write uh, delta t prime as 1 over c integral ds from 1 to 2. It's a um, straightforward consequence of, um, of um, this formula. So you can easily check it yourself. So it shows that proper time um, is directly related to the uh, um, element of the interval along the, uh, um, the trajectory, or as we say, the world line. The world line is the trajectory of the body in four-dimensional space-time. Now, notice the following. If in a certain reference frame, call it k, the interval is time-like, and delta t, which is t2 minus t1, is greater than zero. So what does it mean? That means in the reference frame k, the event 2 happens after 1. Now, if delta t is greater than 0 and the interval is time-like, we cannot find any other reference frame for which delta t is equal to 0. So, um, there is no K prime, where delta t prime is equal to zero. So therefore, 
we cannot pass through zero in any reference frame, delta t will remain positive. So in any other reference frame, um, in any k double prime, delta t double prime is going to be positive. So for time-like intervals, um, we can um, we can always say which event happened in the future with respect to the other, or in the past. Um, the causal connections between different events are possible only for time-like intervals. Indeed, if you have two events, one and two, such that delta s um, one two squared is less than zero, what does it mean? It means c squared delta t squared minus l squared is less than zero. That means the distance between those events is greater than c delta t. So there is no way a signal can uh, be emitted at one point um, at, at event one and be absorbed in event two. There is simply not um, not enough time between these two events for signal uh, to, to propagate from one to two. So there can be no causal relation uh, between them. So here is a graphical representation of these results. I drew a reference frame, uh, the coordinate on one axis and CT on the other. So um, the um, the diagonal lines, the blue lines, correspond to the um, light rays. So each point on those lines uh, are events representing the arrival of light to a particular point. Uh, now the rays pass through the origin, so um, this is where the ray is emitted. Now um, any point um, in this region up here above this uh, cone, so this region is connected to zero, to the origin, by a um, time-like interval. And same thing for this region below. So any point here is connected by a time-like interval to zero. Now, um, in any reference frame, this point here is in the past with respect to zero. So in any reference for, uh, frame, the time for this point is less than zero, any t prime. Here, in any other reference frame, it will be greater than zero. So this is th these are time-like, and this is time-like interval with zero, and this is future, and this is past. Now, everything here corresponds to space-like intervals with the origin. And um, space-like intervals represent events that can have no causal relation to each other. This concludes this segment where we discussed the, uh, um, the basic postulate of uh, relativity, how it leads to the concept of the interval, and the basic features of the intervals, such as space-like, time-like, and causal relations between two events.